Hello, everyone. I'm Tianwei, and uh, my senior independent project is to uh, self-study the modern physics. And uh, I would like to uh, I would like to conduct a uh, mini lecture that uh, sh that both uh, both shows my understanding and uh, to to teach this uh, very advanced and very interesting theories to the, to other people. So uh, let's begin. Although I I made this PowerPoint to show my understanding, I still want to begin with this quote from Richard Feynman, in which he says, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> this is a uh, pretty interesting statement, but uh, he, well, his actually meaning is not that, it's not that uh, everyone can't understand it, it's just a wordplay, but this is a very interesting quote that I found. <laughs> so, as we began on the, I, I think some of you might already seen this quote before, but I would still like to introduce it. So, uh, so, so the scientists between uh, before the uh, before twentieth century, they are the the scientists study, studying physics. They are all focusing on Newtonian mechanics, which is what we call the classical mechanics. And uh, at that point, people were people were pretty confident with Newton's theory. The, and uh, actually, one of the scientists, Albert A. Mitchelson, in 1894, has stated that most of the grand underlying principles have been firmly established. The future truths of physical science are to be looked for in the sixth place of decimals, which means he's pretty like confident about the theory. However, not too, not too, not too late, not not too much years later at. Uh, 1900, uh, William Thompson, another physicist studying the uh, studying the uh, dynamical theory, which is part of the classical physics, they have uh, he, he stated that the beauty and clearness of the dynamical theory, which asserts heat and light to be modes of motion, is at present obscured by two clouds, and those two clouds are the two problems, two uh, very important problems that uh, had actually uh, actually nullified Newton's theory on how does the how does the uh, world basically how does the world work and which uh, the modern physics is emerged from those two those two clouds and that's why I named my PowerPoint the dark clouds over Sir Isaac <laughs> so uh, what are those two clouds they are based they are uh, firstly, the speed of light, in which I was uh, explaining this uh, with the theory of uh, special relativity in the fall. And so in this winter, I, uh, I was um, studying the second uh, part of the dark cloud, which is uh, black body radiation. So, uh, well, I will, I, will, I, will, I will introduce this concept together with uh, quantum mechanics in three parts. Uh, why, how, and what. So the why part is basically, why do we need uh, the theory of quantum mechanics? And what kind of problem does it solve? And the uh, how part is how the quantum mechanics work. And I will provide some basic examples and some basic concepts about how does it work and what is basically what are we using it on? So what, what theoretical development and what applied development do we have uh, after the development of quantum mechanics? So I'll begin at why. So to, to, to understand why we need quantum mechanics, we wanna know like what is black body radiation? So black body, so the black body uh, it's basically a uh, something that is black. When I mean something is black, it, it means that it absorbs light. It's obviously the color black only absorbs uh, visible light, but the actual black body we are talking about like uh, in the physics world are something that absorbs uh, all kind of light and all kind of uh, light at all kind of different wavelengths. Uh, when you absor absorb all kinds of light, it, it actually stores the uh, 
uh, the light as energy, and then it would uh, emit those energies uh, through uh, electromagnetic uh, <laughs> radiations, which in, in which we can like visualize it and we can calculate calculate it. So the physicist did a uh, experiment, uh, oh, and obviously we don't have a like theoretical like black body that we can use to do experiments. But what the physicists use is that they are they are using a bowl shaped men mental stuff that can allow that, that don't allow light to escape. So that it in essence it captures all the light and hold it as if it is a real black body that can uh, hold on to all lights. So this is basically what a black body look like in the in the the the, the bowl shaped uh, in the in the in the up in the corner and the the graph is that is the uh, radio radioactive intense the <coughs> is the radioactive intensity at different temperature so they are trying to they, are, they they got this experimental data and they want to like modelize it using a mathematical equation because then you will like understand what is actually happening so the uh, so the previous tries on the on the modeling the experimental data was conducted by uh, Rayleigh and James. They come up with this Rayleigh James uh, equation that uh, others that uh, that others the model using a uh, mathematical equation. However, they derived that mathematical equation from the concept, and which means. You know, in the in the when when the wavelength is uh, higher, the the frequency would be would be lower, and it, it is expected to have a lower intensity. And when the frequency is higher and wavelength is gets lower, it it, it is expected to have a uh, a, a higher radi radiation intensity. However, their equation does not match the experimental data where there is a uh, rising at first and then decline in the, in the other part. So their equation does not match the experimental data. So that is, this is the part that the classical physics have conflict with the experimental data that, what, that describes what is actually happening. So then a person came out. <laughs> so, <laughs> His name is uh, Max Planck. <laughs> As you can see, uh, in the in the left is Max Planck before he studied physics, <laughs> and in the right is after he studied physics. <laughs> so what so what he came up is is that he just forgot about all the concept stuff. He just forgot about all the concept, and he just looked at looked at this experimental data, and he said, well. I'm very good at math. What if I model the model the experimental data first, and then try to and then try to describe it after I get the equation? So this well, it's loading. <laughs> um, let me see what's the problem here. <laughs> let me reopen it. Right, so so this is what he he came up with, a perfectly a perfect model that describes every point every point of the experimental data, and 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 he so so when he got the equation he looked at the equation and then later he find he he he's trying to interpret the equation into concept because he's not he he did not derive the equation from concept he need to explain like what is happening using the equation. And he found something very interesting, that if his equation is true, which it obviously is, uh, there is a underlying assumption that must be made, which is that the energy emitted from the black body are in small quantas. They are not continuous as what the classical phys 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 physics has uh, assumed. 
has made an assumption on. So what, what, what do I mean by like in quanta? It means that it can only emit like one, one quanta of energy or two quanta of energy. It cannot emit like 1.5 of quanta of energy. So it is concrete rather than continuous. So that brings up that brings up a like very intensive conflict between the uh, what is actually happening in the world and the modern and the classical physics. Because in Newton's theory of uh, calculus, if you remember, that uh, he asserts that everything can be separate in, in, indefinitely. So everything can be separate uh, infinitely. So and you can. And everything is uh, perfectly continuous, which means if C, if point C is between point A and B, there is definitely a time where if you travel from A, a and B, you, there is definitely a time where you step exactly on point C. But from the experiment, but, but from the assumption made by Max Planck, this is not true that uh, the energy have a, that the energy would have to emit in, in different quantas. And that energy emit in quanta theory has also uh, have impact on what we how we measure the world. Because because if you because if you if you think about how you measure the length of an object, you're actually measuring the length of the light that is uh, pro projected into onto that object and reflected back into the uh, into your like measurement. So the problem with uh, quanta energy is that he actually have this equation of that this uh, this uh, this quanta of energy the 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 amount of this energy is uh, proportional to its frequency and frequency higher frequency means uh, means lower wavelengths. If you want to measure something that is very very small, you'd rather have a light that have lower wavelengths, which means a very high frequency, I mean, which means a very high energy. The problem with that is if you are projecting the light, projecting a very intensive light onto a very, very small object, there is, a, there is going to be a point where you cannot get the reflection, and which in essence means that object does not exist. So what is that lens? The, scientific, the scientist says, Actually, they came up with a lens that is 1.61 times 10 to the negative 35 meters. And that lens is actually the lens which if you, if you, uh, you, you can't go like, uh, you can't go like shorter than that or it will just disappear or it will just be not existing. So that is a very, very interesting question. And that has changed many people's view of the world, because obviously uh, prior to that, people think that the world is perfectly continuous, and now it came out that it is not. So this is the first uh, challenge that the classical physics face, and there is another challenge also, that is the uh, uh, wave-particle duality. This this also cannot be explained by the classical physics. What this means is that, uh, uh, what, what the duality means is that, is that uh, if you set up a board, like the, if you set up a board and you have two, po and you have two holes in, in that board, and if you shoot a beam of light into the two holes, uh, from, from the classical theory, uh, it is expected that you have two light spots on the board that is behind, uh, behind the, the, the first one with two holes. Uh, however, when they actually did the experiment, uh, it came out that they have the, uh, the lights were on the second board as, uh, as, a, as a having a specific pattern of one spot being a light part, one spot being the dark part. It's, it's much like uh, the graph of this. It's, this cannot be explained by the classical physics and they they think well that uh, light then must be a uh, they, they must be a particle and a wave at the same time and how could that happen in the classical theory? 
So, and they actually, they actually, so not, not only light have this effect, they actually experimented with uh, electrons. And uh, they, they, and they find out that all those small particles that they previously, and they are, they behave sometimes like particles. And, but however, in this, under this experiment, they begin to behave like a wave. So this is another problem that the classical physics faced. So how, so how do the uh, quantum mechanics solve those problems? Uh, and start by talking about this person. So his name is De Bloy. He's a French, French physicist. And he came up with this idea of a uh, matter wave that he basically asserts that uh, any particle or any, like, anything that is too small, uh, their behavior can actually be described as a mathematical wave. So if you look at the wave here, this could be, this could be a wave that is describing an electron, which is a particle. So what the Bloy says is that like any any matter have a uh, wave form that can describe its uh, action and uh, describing its behavior. So if you look at the wave here, the wave have you know uh, both a wavelength and the amplitude, and the wavelength is uh, associated with the momentum, or in other words, the movement of the object. If the, if the matter has a really, really high momentum, it will expect it to have a, uh, have a shorter, uh, shorter uh, wavelength and vice versa. And the amplitude of the wave, which is the distance from the one wave to another, which from the top of the wave to the like, bottom of the wave, the, the amplitude actually describes the, the probability in which the object is going to appear at the position. So what this means is that this is a very, very crazy assumption that it actually means that, uh, you know, it is, prob pro it is uh, probabilistic that you don't know where the object is. And there is a possibility of the object on, the, on here or on here, or on any anywhere on the on the on, on the on the on the wave, and he thinks that uh, any matter have the have a wave function to describe their behavior, which means even myself will have a wave function describing me. But however, because my momentum is too big, then I will just have one amplitude, like here sitting in front of a computer, but and. And the wave function will uh, is uh, will just have like one amplitude. <laughs> so that is a very crazy assumption. So let's go back to this graph. So this graph, so if this graph describes a electron, when you measure that electron, you cannot actually see the wave because it's just a mathematical function. So what what will you see if you marry that electron? Well, you will see basically an electron, but <laughs> If you, uh, if you put them together, you see that the electron appears somewhere on the, on the wave. So that is what he's saying, that, the, that uh, every matter have a uh, wave function that is describing its behavior. So, and, and, and the measurement actually, actually reduce the wave, the waveform to a single point of electron where you can see. Now there's, there's a question that's like how measurement affects its behavior because if you measure something, you are not actually touching it or physically in contact with it. You're just observing it. How observing like change its state? So here is another person, another physicist. Uh, he's a physicist from German. His name is uh, Schrodinger and he and he developed a thought experiment as opposed to an actual experiment. He developed a thought experiment initially, initially to contrast, initially to contrast the quantum mechanics theory. But actually, uh, and so he used some 
very uh, ridiculous example, but actually the thought experiment turns out to be very helpful in uh, helping to explain what is actually happening. Because although it seems ridiculous, it is what is actually happening. So this is his, uh, th his thought experiment. You may have heard this. It's called Schuliner's cat experiment. Uh, so he basically says that if I put a cat in a box, that the box, uh, where, where, where inside the box there is a radioactive substance that have a exactly 50% chance of emitting a radioactive, uh, radioactive wave that will, uh, that will uh, activate a trap that would uh, release the poison in the box, which to kill the cat. So the, the, the chance of emitting that radioactive substance is exactly 50%. So under that assumption, uh, say if you put the box, if you uh, close the box, that no one could observe what is happening inside. And after a period of time where the radioactive substance may or may not be emitted, the, the, the status of the cat is actually a, a status that is, that is uh, between living and death. Because without observing, you, you can't really know uh, what the status of the cat is. And, and the time when you open the box, actually at the time when you open the box and observe it, the, the, the two state of the cat, which is living and dead, actually collapse into one state, either alive or dead. And it's, uh, and it's will, uh, and, and by observing it, you are confirming its status and actually changed its status from a uh, from a living dead uh, condition to a either living or dead condition. So that is how the measurement will actually affect uh, the state of the measured object. So uh, and and also the also the uh, when describing objects as wave, uh, their actions. Uh, are similar. The actors are actually similar than what wave will behave. Uh, they will have uh, so 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 for the waves there is a superposition co concept and the entanglement concept. For superposition is that it's just that two waves adding together will become a a, a third wave that have a uh, larger amplitude. And that is also happens in the matter wave, in the matter wave uh, theory, that if you add the matter wave of two objects together, it will also have the superposition, where, where if you add, you have a higher possibility. That if uh, two waves subtract each other, they will have a zero possibility at that particular point. So the behavior and the entanglement is basically where two waves can meet together and become one wave that describe both two things. So basically all the features of uh, what wave has, the, the, the matter wave also have, has it. So the matter wave is pretty effective in uh, explaining the, 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 the previous questions that classical physics cannot solve. So why the energy have to emit in uh, in the quantness, that is, that is the question that, that the classical physics can't answer, but the matter wave could. Because, because if you think about the electron uh, as a matter wave, uh, the electron is hold, is hold to its orbit, and which means that the wave must be tied end to end, like this shape. So if you have a wave like this, you will, you, it, 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 it is not possible to have a, a wavelength that is not an integer. Because you can either have a single wave, double wave, or a, uh, or a triple wave, but you cannot have like 1.5 wave because then the ends will not tie together and the electron is not on their orbit. 
So this is pretty, this is very effective in solving the problems. So let's move on on the last part, like what, what does the quantum mechanics do? So there is, so, so same as other physics area, there's also, there's always a uh, theoretical development and uh, applied development. I'd like to start on the theoretical development. That's, so I'll start by, start by a rather philosophical question. That is, does God play dice? Uh, what, what does I mean by that? It's basically, is, the, is our world, world deterministic or probabilistic? It's, uh, so this, this concept uh, con uh, concerns with the future. That, you know, because, uh, we, because, the <clears throat> because we can calculate the motions of nearly everything, if we know the, know the position and know the uh, movement of like any particle in the world, will we just could calculate what, what's going to be happening in the future? Or, or it is not, it is probabilistic that uh, even though we can calculate, we cannot know the future. So this is actually not a recent philosophical question. It's, it's originated like long ago and uh, some physicists are expressing their own opinion. Einstein, for example, he's, he's, a, he's a believer of a, a deterministic world. He, in the 1927, in the Solway Conference, where the physicists meet together and discuss about their new development, Einstein said that God does not play dice with the universe, which means the field, which means he believed that the future may be determined by the current or the past, because all the all the motions we see in the future is just collisions between particles, right? It it's, uh, works the same for our even for like uh, our human body, the thing we think. The, the the speech we say is all the it's all collisions of the chemical in our brain, right? So he's he believed that uh, the world is deterministic, and this belief is not actually is not uh, is not emerged it has emerged like long before Einstein. So in 19th century, a French uh, mathematician called Laplace. He had, he had proposed a theory of what, what is called a Laplace demon. So he, think that, he thinks that uh, if there is a demon, not human, there's a demon that he knows like the position and the movement, which is just the momentum of any particle in the world, of any particle, and he can do very, very fast calculations. Would that mean that the demon Will 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 know the future just like he knows the past, because he can calculate the how the how those particles are going to collide and going to interact in the future, and thus predict what is what's going to happen. So Laplace demon was a very interesting, not only scientific but also philosophical question to think. But the quantum mechanics theory had stopped this. So this this person Heisen, his, this person his name is uh, Heisenberg. He is a <clears throat> he is a uh, also a German scientist, and he proposed a theory of uh, what is called uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So what what he basically saying is that we cannot we cannot get the position and the momentum of one object at the same time. And that is not because of uh, technological issues. It's theoretically that it is impossible. So he had a very beautiful mathematical equation. And when, transfer, when, 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 when transformed into a graphical language, is, he basically means this. So imagine, so this is a wave of an electron. That's for example, let's take the matter wave example. This is the a wave for electron, and what what we will do if you measure the if you measure the 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 
momentum of it. Like I, like I said previously, the momentum is corresponds to the wavelength, which is the distance between the two waves. And so as you can see on the graph, the wavelength is different at different positions. So if you want to measure a wavelength, you'd ha rather have a wavelength that is uh, constant throughout the entire wave. And the only wave that ha have, a, have a constant wavelength is a sine wave, which means if you are measuring the wavelength, you will disturb the wave and make it into a sine wave. So here you have a wave that has a uh, constant, constant wavelength. However, the problem with this constant wavelength, as you may already know, is that the amplitudes are all the same, which means that the electron, for example, in our example, will, will have an equal chance of occurring at any position along this wave. So here you know the exact, exact uh, momentum or its movement, but you don't know its position. So now, if people say, well, then what, 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 what will, we, will it like if we just focus on the position? Well, if you want, want to measure an exact position, you must reduce the wave so that it only have a single amplitude, because that is the only kind of wave that have an exact uh, position that the electron must be on, which, in which the wave will be reduced to something like this there is only one amplitude here, which means the electron is just here, but not anywhere else. But the problem with this wave, on the other hand, is that this wave, you cannot really tell the wavelengths of this wave because it only has one amplitude. And this, this wave is, uh, and so you cannot get the movement or the momentum or the, of the particle. If you measure, so what Heisenberg is saying is basically, if you, if you measure an exact position, you're likely to get, to get a uh, undefined momentum. If you measure an exact momentum, you're likely to get a uh, undefined position for small particles like electron. So as you can see that I put, I, I intentionally put Einstein's a quote on the upper half of the PowerPoint. That is because, that is not for fun, this is because that there is another quote on the lower half, which is stated by uh, Niels Bohr, also on the, also on the so Soviet conference in 1927. So Niels Bohr were, was the mentor of, of uh, Heisenberg, and he is in supportive of his students' research. He's saying that, <laughs> He just fight back Einstein, saying that Einstein don't tell God what to do. <laughs> so that was a very that, that was a very intensive debate between the scientists, and actually uh, the debate ends with Bohr actually using Einstein's uh, theory of uh, general relativity to prove his student Heisenberg's work on his uncertainty principle, and may, which makes Einstein to give up and, uh, and uh, to uh, accept the idea that the world is, uh, uh, is, is uh, probabilistic. And so uh, aside from theoretical development, there is also applied uh, physics developments that uh, are or originated from the concepts of quantum mechanics. And actually, thanks to uh, Mr. Tierney, I have, I have uh, I have uh, looked over the two most important or most advanced te technologies that uh, the quantum mechanics could be applied to. The first one is uh, quantum cryptography, which is basically a encryp uh, in an encryption made based on the series of uh, quantum mechanics. As I said, uh, in quantum mechanics world, where O object exists as uh, a waves, uh, and ob observe an action of observing will disturb the wave and uh, will uh, make it to uh, collapse. Uh, so, which means if a message is encrypted by quantum theory, uh, it will actually 
uh, it will actually be detected if someone has already observed the message. And in that way, we can make sure that uh, until the message gets to where it should get, it's, it's not being, uh, being, uh, being read or being observed. Another, another big field is uh, quantum computing, in which uh, it uses the, uh, uses the features of wave, such as superposition and entanglement, in which you can reduce like two waves into one wave, and you can add up, subtract wave to, have, to let them have different behaviors. In, that, in this way, that uh, you, can, you can calculate multiple things together in, uh, <coughs> in a unit which is called qubit, instead of bytes we, we usually use in our uh, current computer. So this would actually allow the uh, compu computational speed to uh, increase by a, a great amount. And uh, and these are the two ge uh, two general fields in which the quantum mechanics are applying to. And this is the end of the presentation. And thanks for uh, listening. And uh, <coughs> this is my reference. So there's uh, two books that I read. And there's a uh, MIT Open Course I have attended, not attend. I have uh, visited on online. And uh, actually, actually, thanks to this book, this book is Brief Answers to Big Questions by Stephen Hawking. This book is actually the award that is given to me by the Trinity Polling School during, the, uh, during last year's Stepping Up. Uh, as, uh, so, so this, this book was actually the award given to me as uh, the junior class honor student. And after I read the book, it, the book is very like, inspiring and actually uh, made me like more become more interested in this field of uh, like modern physics and it's also special thanks to a mentor mr tierney thanks for your uh, answers to the questions it's really like allows me to uh, clear up my understandings on the previous uh, theory of special relativity and also help me on the on this part of the of my <coughs> SIP. Uh. Fantastic. <laughs> great, great stuff. There's, there's another book, uh, something that came out recently uh, called Life on the Edge. And it's mm -hmm. about the field, which it, this emerging field of quantum biology, where they're actually looking at the mechanisms that happen inside a cellular structure and there's certain biological processes that the only way that they can function the way they do is if, is if you actually have things like superposition and, and some of these really strange effects happening uh, within a cell structure. It's, um, I've got, I, I have the book in paperback. I'm about 50 pages into it. <laughs> it's going to take me a long time. But, uh, but it's, another, it's another application of, of quantum mechanics that's very interdisciplinary, where the biologists and the physicists are trying to come together on it. But, hmm. um, but this is fantastic. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. At, at what point in the process did the two of you get together and start speaking? So it's basically I have some questions that need to be cleared up on my previous uh, presentation of uh, uh, theory of special relativity because there are some problems that I'm not like totally uh, understanding and also I have a lot uh, some of the like new questions regarding the applications of the uh, quantum mechanics so I just so so we uh, started the email the email like uh, questions through uh, Mr. Lahu. Emails and links. Yeah. Can I, can I interject here? First off, that was fascinating. Um, two points. One is kudos to Mrs. Foster because she's the one who bought that book for you last year. I remember carrying it out of the bookstore with her, but she picked out all the books. Um, but one thing, and this is sort of an observation, I hope you become a teacher. Uh, the way you present and just the cadence of your voice and the enthusiasm 
is, is marvelous. And, and the fact that you're doing this in a second language is mind boggling. So mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate you, know, you sharing your knowledge with us with such enthusiasm uh, and doing it in English, not in Chinese. So thank you, that, that was really, really interesting. I, my head hurts, but it's very interesting. I, I echo the enthusiasm. It was, I, I would like to pretend that I have any idea of what you said. I recognized a wave, that was good for me. Um, <laughs> but and, <laughs> I don't mean to be self-deprecating, but honestly, you are just, you know, as they say in Boston, really smat. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm blown away. And, but Tianwei, your enthusiasm for this is palpable. And it is very exciting to see someone so excited about, about this. And, and lucky uh, Michigan for getting you after leaving Trinity Pauling. Uh, I know you guys, you're just going to do great things. I'm, I, you know, and you did this in the comfort of your own dorm room. So I mean, I imagine what you could do in a space that didn't echo in the background and you, know, you had boards up and stuff like that. And uh, Mr. Tierney, wonderful job stepping in to help this very smart young man with his uh, questions. Super appreciate it. Happy to help, and I'm happy to keep that, dis that dialogue going. And well done on Michigan. Fantastic, fantastic engineering program there, too. Uh, Thank you. Cool. Well done. Yeah, and keep in touch. Let's keep in touch. Let me know. Any, any other questions? Anything else? I'm, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, Tiwi, I, I would echo what everyone said. I'm, I've seen, this is the third time I've seen you present because I saw the rough draft and then the final in the fall. And I concur completely with what Mr. Mead said. You're, you make things incredibly interesting that I had, had, I had no background in. Um, I love that you bring your humor in. Um, and I, it was, I was wrapped in attention the whole time. So, um, Kudos to you, and and I also would would uh, back Mr. Meet up that I thought about halfway through this that man doing this in a second I couldn't do what you just did in my first language so um, very good job very proud of you thank you.